Good morning. Welcome to today's briefing. My name is Colleen Cradell. I'm the Director of Research at Next10, and I'm happy to welcome you to our briefing on today's report, The Future of California's Water Energy Climate Nexus. I'm here with our experts and speakers from the Pacific Institute, and we've got a lot to share with you today, so we're going to go ahead and jump in. Before we do, I want to remind all of our attendees that we will be recording today's session. The recording will be emailed to each of you tomorrow after today's briefing and available on our website. You can also uh, reach the report itself either on our website or you'll find it in the handouts feature of your GoToWebinar control panel. So if you can find the handouts portion of the control panel, you'll find both the full PDF of the report as well as the executive summary. I also wanted to let everyone know that we will be taking questions throughout the presentation, but reserving time to answer those questions until the end of the presentation. So if you do have questions for our speakers, you can continue to ask those using the questions feature in your control panel, again, throughout the presentation. And then when we reach the end of our presentation, we'll go ahead and address all questions. So without further ado, I, I'd like to move on. Stephanie, if we could go to the next slide. So today's briefing includes our three authors and speakers from the Pacific Institute on this report. Dr. Peter Glick, President Emeritus of the Pacific Institute, Heather Cooley, Director of Research at the Pacific Institute, and Dr. Julia Sinai, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting your name wrong, um, researcher at the Pacific Institute and a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Again, my name is Colleen with Next10. We commissioned the report with the Pacific Institute and are supporting the outreach for this important work. And I'll be serving as our moderator for today's presentation and question and answer. You can go ahead and move on. So before I turn it over to our research team, I wanted to briefly share some motivations and objectives for this report. From Next10's perspective, we closely follow climate and clean energy trends in the state. And what we know from our research is that California is not quite on track to meet its 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets. We also know that the energy intensive water sector can play a role in meeting those climate goals. Everyone is fully aware of California's challenges with drought in, the, in recent years. And we, we know that that is persistent. Um, those trends combined with other uh, supply and population growth trends are leading to further constraints and further challenges in terms of carbon intensity in the water sector. So we know that all of this will affect the water related greenhouse gas emissions moving forward in the state. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much research to really fully understand what that impact of the water sector emissions are. So that's where this report comes in. The objective of this research was to estimate the energy and greenhouse gas footprint of California's urban and agricultural water sectors and to look at that under various future water demand and supply scenarios to better understand what changes might help address greenhouse gas reduction opportunities. You can go ahead. Finally, just to lay things out as we set into the research presentation, this report included a comprehensive assessment of the energy and greenhouse gas footprint related to water in California. <clears throat> Our researchers also looked at case studies which highlighted key risks and opportunities associated with water-related energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in order to better understand what opportunities might exist in different regions throughout the state and for different aspects of the sector and different types of sources. This culminated in a thorough set of policy recommendations that can help reduce California's water-related energy and greenhouse gas footprint. And that's what we're here to share with you today. So without further ado, I'd like to pass this over to Peter, who will dig into more of the background and important context for this research project. Again, before I, I pass it over to Peter, I just want to remind folks, please go ahead and drop any questions in the question feature as we proceed. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Colleen, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Peter Glick. I'm the co-founder and president emeritus of the Pacific Institute. For those of you who don't know the Institute, the Institute is a global think tank addressing uh, freshwater problems and especially 
solutions. We're based in Oakland. Uh, we've worked extensively on climate, water, and energy issues over the last many years, and we're delighted to have partnered with Next 10 on this project. I'm just gonna provide a little more background before I turn it over to my colleagues to talk about the methods and the conclusions of the report. Uh, a background, first of all, on California's water, energy, and greenhouse gases. Uh, many people don't understand this, but those three issues are very closely linked. Uh, California's water system, the entire system from collection to the distribution to use to treatment of water is responsible for a very significant fraction of California's energy use. About 20% of total statewide electricity use goes to the water system and to the way we use water. About a third of non-power plant natural gas consumption goes to our water system, again, largely for heating the water that we use in our homes and the water that's used in industry. Uh, about 100 billion gallons, a little less, of diesel consumption statewide goes to the goes to the water system. And the state water project, which moves water from one part of the state to another, especially from the mountains in Northern California to Southern California, is the single largest consumer of electricity in the state. As a result of this, our water use has very important implications for the state's energy use and, of course, for the state's greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. A little more background on California's water system and how changes in supply and demand are changing over time. Again, as Colleen mentioned at the beginning, uh, the state faces a, a very severe drought right now, a two-year drought. Our new water year is about to begin, but we don't know whether the next year will be wet or dry and worsen the drought conditions that we face. Uh, in the urban sector, what we see are both growing populations, but also a declining per capita water use over time, which is actually good news. Uh, we're using less water per person in the urban sector uh, every year, although populations continue to grow. And for some water agencies, the expectation is that the demand will continue to grow. And in the urban sector, again, we're seeing a shift in where that water is coming from, a shift in water supply to more local sources with varying energy intensity. Again, as my colleagues will talk about, these different sources have different energy intensities and different implications for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In the agricultural sector, water use has been flat in recent years, uh, but we see a greater and greater reliance on groundwater, especially during droughts. As surface water disappears, the agricultural sector is turning more and more to groundwater. But even in a normal water year, uh, overdraft of groundwater is a serious problem, uh, and declining groundwater levels has implications for our energy use. It takes more energy to pump up the groundwater that the agricultural sector is using. So we might see flat water use, but we may see increasing energy requirements to meet agricultural water demands as well. Next slide. Some key takeaways from the report, some of our key conclusions, so you know what we'll be saying as we move through the report's conclusions. First of all, water-related energy and greenhouse gases are driven by the total water use and the mix of sources. How much water we use and where that water comes from defines the energy and greenhouse gas consequences of the water system. And under current or increased per capita water use scenarios, where water use is growing or per capita water use is growing, we expect both energy and greenhouse gas emissions to increase. In the urban sector, water use efficiency improvements offer the greatest potential reductions in, in water-related energy use and emissions. If we can use water more efficiently, it's the greatest opportunity to cut the amount of energy we use and the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that water use. Decarbonization, and by decarbonization, what I mean is the removal of carbon emitting sources from our energy system, coupled with greater electrification of end use, in particular, getting rid of natural gas water heaters in our homes, offer the greatest potential to accelerate reductions in water-related greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, the more carbon we can get out of our broad energy system, and the more we can eliminate natural gas 
from our water heaters, uh, that offers the greatest reduction in reducing emissions. Agricultural water use is far greater than urban water use overall in California. Three or four times more water is used in California for the agricultural sector, but urban water use is very much more energy intensive, that is energy per unit water used, and it produces much more greenhouse, many more greenhouse gases than the agricultural sector. And finally, restoration of groundwater levels, if we can figure out how to do that through the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, that'll be addressed later in the conversation as well, and reducing pumping can cut the energy use required by the agricultural sector. So restoring groundwater levels, cutting groundwater uh, energy use is the best alternative for reducing agricultural emissions uh, and agricultural energy use. Uh, let me, let's have the next slide, but let me turn this now over to my colleague, uh, Julie, Julia Sinai. Uh, Dr. Sinai played a lead role in the analysis and the methodology. She's the lead author on the report, and she's going to talk about the research design, the analysis, and the methodology. Thank you so much, Colleen and Peter. Uh, as Peter mentioned, I'm gonna go over the methodology first and then some of our key results. And then Heather will summarize the analysis results and provide our policy recommendations. So next slide, please. So in order to calculate the energy and GHG footprint related to water in California, we first identified the energy intensities or the energy per unit of water associated with each stage of the managed water cycle, all the way from extraction to wastewater treatment, as Peter mentioned. We then calculated the GHG intensity or the carbon emissions per unit of energy associated with the energy sources that we looked at um, which in this case are electricity and natural gas. Third, we developed scenarios of future water demands and supplies for the urban and ag sectors. And finally, we applied the energy and GHG intensities that we calculated to those future as well as historical water scenarios to calculate the total energy and GHG emissions associated with California water. And based on these analysis results, we offer policy recommendations on how to reduce the energy and GHG footprints related to water going forward. Next slide. So um, as Peter mentioned, energy is required to power all stages of the managed water cycle. And what do I mean by the managed water cycle? It's I'm referring to the stages that are listed in this figure here um, from supply extraction or generation to conveyance, treatment, distribution, and use wastewater collection to wastewater treatment. And energy is required in all of these stages. Um, so our first step was to map the energy, sorry, the water sources and water uses to each of these stages, and then the energy intensities or the energy requirements associated with those stages. So I'll provide some examples of what those water processes are that correspond to each of those stages. First, um, starting from the left, uh, in the supply extraction category, we have groundwater pumping because it takes quite a lot of energy to pump water from the ground up to the surface. And then for other sources, uh, surface water that's delivered through the state water project, which is a large aqueduct, um, it requires a lot of energy to convey that water long distances and often over mountains. Then if we're, if we're talking about urban water, that gets treated at a drinking water treatment plant. We assume ag water doesn't receive drinking water treatment. Then that water for urban uses gets distributed from the treatment plant to homes. And one of the major end uses is for water heating. Finally, it gets wastewater treatment. And some of that wastewater is further treated for recycled water uses, either potable or not potable. Um, next slide, please. And so there's quite a lot of variation in the energy intensity of these different water supply sources. Um, not just between the sources, but also geographically in the different regions of California. This figure here, um, going down the rows, shows the energy intensity of the different water supply sources. And then the range of the bars shows the ranges between the different regions. Um, as you can see here, local surface water 
is the least energy intensive, whereas desalinated water from seawater is the most energy intensive. And then conveyance energy for the State Water Project and Colorado River Aqueduct are also quite energy intensive. And the upper end of that range is to get that water to Southern California. Next slide. So once we've calculated the energy intensity associated with each of the water supply sources and the other stages that I mentioned, we also look at the GHG intensity associated with the energy sources, electricity and natural gas. And so for electricity, we assume a statewide average uh, carbon emissions per unit of energy, and we assume that it's all generated in California. And here I'm showing a figure of the energy intensity or the greenhouse gas intensities that we're assuming, which come from simulations for the three major energy agencies to uh, project the state reaching or being on target to reach its decarbonization or SB100 goals. And then we use a fixed GHG intensity for natural gas, which is the other fuel source that we look at um, for water heating. Next slide. And then the third main step of our analysis is to generate future water demand and supply scenarios. And given data availability, we do that separately for urban and ag uses. Um, we look at future water demand for 2020 to 2035 in five-year increments by aggregated up to the hydrologic region, of which there are 10 in California. And given our focus on changes in future demand, we hold the supply mix or the ratio of different supply sources as given um, from water suppliers plans for the urban sector or from DWR for the ag sector uh, for each region. And so we don't evaluate the feasibility or the availability of supply to meet those future demand scenarios, but Heather will talk about two case studies where we do analyze how that might uh, change if supply mix changes occur in the LA region and also in the Central Valley. Um, so let me start with the urban scenarios here. Um, first, uh, we started with our data from the 2015 urban water management plans, which cover about 400 water suppliers and 90% of the state's population. I'll start with the high scenario, which basically takes uh, their water uh, projections as given from the suppliers, and it assumes a growing per capita water demand and a growing population. Then our mid scenario, we hold the 2015 per capita demand constant and just allow the population to grow. And that's kind of business as usual. And the low scenario represents a high level of water efficiency and conservation where we decrease per capita demand 2% per year, which is um, consistent with recent trends among the top water suppliers in the urban sector. And in the ag scenarios, um, we got our data from simulations from the 2018 California Water Plan from DWR for the three hydrologic regions in Central Valley. And those included over or about 100 scenarios uh, combining different climate scenarios as well as urban growth assumptions. And so we, from those 100, we selected three that bound the low, mid, and high range. The high range, or sorry, the low range uh, assumes high urban growth and an increased encroachment on urban, from urban uh, users to ag land that takes ag land out of production and lowers ag water use. And it's also the scenario with the greatest climate impact. Then the high scenario is the opposite of that, with the lowest urban growth, least encroachment on ag land, and the lowest climate impact. And the mid is an urban growth scenario that's kind of in the middle. And so those are our main scenarios, which provide the water volumes to which we apply the energy and GHG intensities. So let me now go through some of their key results. Next slide. I'll start with the urban results. <laughs> uh, great. Um, so I'll start with the urban water demand results here. The figure on the left shows the total uh, urban water demand for each of the five-year increments that we looked at for each of our three scenarios, um, aggregated up to all of California's urban sector. 
And in the first panel, it's the water supplier projection scenario, the high scenario. The middle is the mid case where we assume constant per capita demand and just allow population to go up. And then the third is our low scenario with a decreasing per capita demand. And so what we find is um, under current per capita demand, the mid case scenario, water demand could still go up total 24% overall between 2015 and 2035, or as much as 44% if per capita demand goes up. On the other hand, with water conservation and steady decline of water use um, in the urban sector, we could see a reduction in our total water use in the urban sector as much as 17%. Um, and the largest increases in the mid and high scenarios come from residential use, which has significant energy implications because those tend to be the most energy intensive uh, end use sectors. In terms of supply, to meet the demand in the scenarios that are shown on the left, uh, we see the largest absolute increases in surface and groundwater. Um, however, the largest percentage increases are in these alternative sources, recycled water, brackish desal, and stormwater. And while those are still a really, relatively small part of our total portfolio of water sources, they are an increasing share. And at the same time, we are seeing an a decrease, I'm sorry, a decrease in the share of imported water to Southern California in the urban sector. Next slide. So what does that mean in terms of energy usage? For the urban sector, we look at electricity across all stages of the water cycle and natural gas, again, for water heating only. So here, this figure shows electricity use. Um, the colors represent the different stages, and you can clearly see that the purple bar is the biggest share in terms of electricity use for end uses for water heating. And um, the figure shows that without conservation, in our high scenario, our electricity use could go up as much as 40% between 2015 and 2035, and our gas could go up as much as 45%. However, with efficiency efforts, our uh, electricity use associated with urban water could decrease 19%, and our gas use could go down 16%, which is pretty significant over the same period. Next slide. Sorry, next slide, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what does that mean for GHG emissions? Oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what does that mean for GHG emissions? Across the electricity and natural gas uh, use related to urban water, GHG emissions could go up total 2% in our high case or could decrease as much as 41% in our low case. And really the largest driver of GHG emissions, again, is not just our total water usage, but how much is coming from energy intensive water heating, which is at the moment primarily done from natural gas. So we can lower our emissions by lowering our water usage, by also electrifying our water heaters and decarbonizing our electricity generation. So I'm kind of hinting at some of the policy recommendations that Heidi's gonna talk about later. Next slide. Great, so now I will finish by talking about our ag results uh, focused on the Central Valley. Here this figure shows our Central Valley supply deliveries by source uh, across the three different scenarios, low, mid, and high. Um, and as you can see, there isn't much variation between the scenarios, um, but across the scenarios, our total water use for the Central Valley ag sector decreases between two and 5% between 2015 and 2035. And the largest driver of those decreases really comes from the assumption from the underlying data set that urban growth will take ag land out of production and therefore lower our water use. And the overall climate impacts from these scenarios um, in this short-term time horizon appear pretty minimal. However, we expect that to be much larger as we approach the mid-century and certainly the end of century. And I will also note that um, the impacts of SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, are not explicitly uh, incorporated in these scenarios. However, again, Heather will talk about that because we have a case study on that. So um, across the scenarios, the largest absolute decreases come from groundwater and surface water from the State Water Project. So next slide. 
So what are the energy and, implica uh, and GHG implications of the ag results? Uh, electricity use associated with ag water decreases 44 to 6%, um, primarily driven by the decreasing water use. Um, however, GHG emissions across the scenarios decrease as much as 60%. And that's because all of the energy use that we're looking at is associated with electricity. And so there's a combined effect of both lower water use and decarbonization that fully leverage the benefits of using electricity um, and really lower the emissions associated with ag water. And so um, these were the key results. Uh, I want to highlight that these were all aggregated up either to Central Valley for the ag results or to the statewide level for the urban results, but we have quite a bit more detail in the report if you're interested that show the geographic variation of these results in both water, energy, and GHG. So I welcome you to take a closer look at that. And so now I will take, uh, I will hand it over to Heather Cooley, who's the Director of Research at the Pacific Institute, um, who will summarize these key results, describe our case studies, and provide the policy recommendations that come out of them on how we can actually achieve the lower energy and GHG footprint related to water. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Let's go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. So I want to talk, uh, as Julia mentioned, uh, we evaluated three urban water scenarios. Um, in the high water use case, which is shown on the right, that was based on information reported by water suppliers in their urban water management plans. Um, water suppliers projected that their total water demand would increase by about 44% between 2015 and 2035. That, of course, increases water-related electricity and natural gas use. Um, and this, the results of this suggest that despite major efforts to decarbonize the electricity grid, water-related greenhouse gas emissions would increase by 2%. By contrast, the low water use case, case, which is shown on the left, maintains the 15-year uh, trend of a 2% reduction in per capita use. Um, in this case, total water use declines by 17% despite continued population and economic growth. This results in a reduction in water-related electricity and natural gas use. So it suggests that urban efficiency, when coupled with decarbonization of the grid, can reduce water-related greenhouse gas emissions by 41%. Next slide, please. Just in summary around the agricultural scenarios, we evaluated three scenarios. Agricultural water use is expected to decline across these scenarios by about two to 5%. And again, that was largely due to urban encroachment. It did not look at sort of sigma related issues. Um, reductions in water use are then projected to re reduce electricity use. And that coupled with the decarbonization of the electricity grid um, could lead to significant reductions in agriculture's water related greenhouse gas emissions. We estimate by about 62% across the scenarios. We'll talk a bit more about sigma in the next couple of case studies to talk about how that might shift this. Next slide, please. In addition to the scenarios, we also examined a couple of case studies, three case studies, to identify additional risks and opportunities at the water energy climate nexus in California. The first was a case study looking at Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles has announced goals of reducing reliance on water imported from uh, Northern California and from the Colorado River, River Aqueduct. Um, they've also announced goals of recycling 100% of their wastewater and investing in storm water capture. And while they're taking these steps largely to improve their water resilience, our analysis finds that replacing imported water with a combination of storm water capture and water reuse can also help to meet energy reduction and greenhouse gas goals. There are also renewable energy opportunities within water and wastewater systems, and that's what we examined in the second case study. East Bay Municipal Utility District, uh, which is located in Northern California, uh, made a strategic pivot from an operator of a wastewater treatment and discharge facility to an operator of an energy recovery facility. Um, their West Oakland plant 
not only produces recycled water, it also generates energy. Nearly a decade ago, it became the first wastewater treatment plant in North America to be a net energy producer. Today, it's estimated that they are able to avoid about two and a half million dollars in energy costs each year and generate $750,000 in revenue by selling the excess energy that they generate back to the grid. So they're not only, of course, saving ratepayers money in that sense, they're also helping to contribute to meeting our greenhouse gas targets. Finally, while ag is not nearly as energy intensive as urban water, over-reliance on groundwater is causing groundwater levels to drop. We looked at um, some of the minimum thresholds that are put forth in for San Joaquin Valley groundwater base, uh, basin plans under SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And those thresholds suggest that groundwater levels could be 100 feet below current levels. This would, of course, increase the energy required to pump water to the surface and offset some of those greenhouse gas emission reduction targets that we saw in the scenarios. Next slide, please. I want to conclude with some of our key uh, takeaways from the report. Uh, we find that water-related energy and greenhouse gas driven uh, greenhouse gases are driven by total water use and the mix of sources. And at least for the urban sector are, are expected to increase under current or increased per capita water use. We find that urban water efficiency offers the greatest reductions in water related energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. We also find that in combination, in addition to reducing usage, efforts to decarbonize our electricity grid and to electrify our end uses, especially around water heaters, can accelerate our reductions in water-related greenhouse gas emissions and again, help us to meet those targets. Agricultural water use is far greater than that of California's urban sector, um, but their urban water is nine times more energy intensive and produces nine times more greenhouse gas emissions. However, there are opportunities even within agriculture to restore groundwater levels and reduce pumping, and that, can that too can help to cut energy use of the agricultural sector and, and of course the associated greenhouse gas recommendations. Next slide. I want to talk now uh, about some of our policy recommendations. We have, we have a few uh, to put forward. Next, please. We offer several policy recommendations that can strengthen California's commitment to its climate goals while also ensuring a sustainable path for water management. First is to expand water conservation and efficiency efforts. We have made significant improvements in water efficiency and urban efficiency especially, um, but far more can be done. Urban conservation and efficiency can help us to meet our water goals as well as our energy and climate goals. Second is to accelerate water heater electrification. Across the managed water cycle, natural gas water heaters are the single largest emitters of greenhouse gases. We know that electric heat pumps are far more energy efficient and can provide significant greenhouse gas benefits at, as the electricity grid is carbonized. So it's really in combination, can be a very powerful tool for helping us to meet our climate goals. In addition, restoring groundwater levels and expanding the use of variable and high efficiency pumps. Um, together, these measures can help reduce energy use, energy costs, and also greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. We also recommend that financial incentives and, rec and regulatory pathways for greater investments in less energy and greenhouse gas water systems. Um, existing financial incentives and programs for energy and greenhouse gas reductions, things like cap, cap and trade programs and funds should be available to water suppliers for not only reducing their demand, but also shifting to less energy intensive water sources. We also recommend expanding water data uh, reporting and energy use tracking. Um, we spent a significant amount of time in this analysis really pulling together the scenarios, the water use, uh, both for uh, on the urban side, but on the agricultural side. 
a more harmonized set of projections of future water demand and supply along with energy use and energy intensity of those supplies are really essential for understanding that water energy climate nexus in California. I do think that this analysis was an important step, but there were some gaps and certainly better reporting can help us to uh, resolve those. Ultimately, the energy intensity of the water system must be tracked alongside other state environmental indicators to help us meet our energy and greenhouse gas goals. And finally, we recommend that there be more formalized coordination between water and energy regulators and utilities. If water system energy demands grow as projected, California's electricity and natural gas systems will need to alter infrastructure planning to ensure that energy remains reliable. Um, coordinate improvements in coordination between these energies can lead to better integrated energy and water planning, it can lead to reduced costs to consumers, and certainly it can lead to faster decarbonization of California's water systems and of its greenhouse gas intensity. So I'm going to stop there. I would like to hand it over to Colleen, um, who will now field the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Um, and our, Stephanie's put up our last slide for us. Here are our emails if you have direct questions for any of our speakers or need access to any elements of the report that Next 10 can help you with. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into questions. We have a number of questions that have come up about specific methodology and assumption um, questions, so I'll start with some of those. And just a reminder to our attendees, you can go ahead and drop any questions you might have into that questions feature in your control panel. Um, so first up, whoever would like to take this from the Pacific Institute team, what was the assumption for renewable energy mix in the energy sources? Uh, we used the projections uh, that came out of the SB100 modeling um, that was done for the CPUC, CEC, and CAISO and CARVE um, a couple months ago that um, looked at different trajectories to reach 100% um, uh, clean energy by 2045. So um, our projections only went to 2035, so it was consistent with whatever the renewable assumptions were um, to reach the zero mark or to reach the SP100 goals. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the agricultural regions analyzed. Um, one was, did you look at regions outside the Central Valley? Another, did you include the Imperial Valley? So if you could perhaps speak a little bit to those specifics. Uh, I, I guess I can go <laughs> again. Uh, yeah, we looked at just the three hydrologic regions in Central Valley, so Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Tulare, um, because the, that was the data that was available from um, the DWR analysis that focused just on Central Valley. So unfortunately, we did not include um, any ag outside of that, um, but the Central Valley, as far as I know, covers about 80% of ag water use in the state so it's nearly all of it um so really helps drive home the point from heather about needing better data and reporting as well i think exactly um, i was just going <laughs> to jump in on that colleen um you know certainly we wanted to cover the entire state i think one of the major challenges we had in the scenarios was there there wasn't great data particularly projections around agricultural water use and even those that were available, as we noted on several occasions, really only modeled urban encroachment and to some extent, some, some climate impacts. Although it, by 2035, I think the climate impacts weren't expected to be too significant. Um, we do though, as we noted, and that was one of the reasons in the case study, we explored the Sigma implementation and, and what that could do. Um, you know, there are some important potential changes um, again, both positive and negative, depending on how, how Sigma is implemented, how some of the other issues um, sort of emerge that could alter the energy and greenhouse gas emissions of agriculture. We think they'd be important to look at. And again, one of the reasons we recommended that there be a more harmonized set of projections 
um, for both urban and agricultural water use in California. I would I would just add also there's a parallel question on the urban side to just again highlight Heather's comment that uh, better data are needed. Just as we addressed about 80% of the agricultural water use by looking at the Central Valley component, the urban sector looked at about 90%, but not 100%, about 90% of urban water use statewide. Thank you. A few um, additional assumption type questions. What's the California population projection you used for 2035? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know that off the top of my head. I, I, my, uh, I recall, and maybe you can correct me, Julia, that we were using the projections in the urban water management plans. Is that right? Um, so we used it for the, for the, I think it was 400 and some odd uh, urban water suppliers. It was their sort of projections going out into the future. So likely handled by their regional cogs or something along those lines as part of yeah, the I think. Plan. Yeah. yeah, in many cases they're using sort of Department of Finance or as you know, they'll adjust that based upon their, their service areas. Um, we didn't try to sort of validate that. We were really relying on, on, on their modeling. Okay, so next up here, um, does this report account for scenarios in which we significantly increase the availability of reclaimed water for urban and agricultural uses? How is the energy required to continuously treat and recycle water compared to avoided energy use of pumping groundwater or moving water from the Sierras to SoCal? So more broadly, what assumptions around the potential increased use of recycled water and, and its impacts versus energy intensity of other sources? Julia, do you want to jump in maybe on the scenario piece and kind of how you handled the supply piece? And then I can maybe talk a little bit about the, the issues that were fell into the, the case studies and the kind of the broader questions. Yeah, so we use the supply mix that was included in each of the uh, urban water management plan and their supplier projections, which had uh, projections of future recycled water use. Um, in many cases, they did not indicate whether that was for potable or non-potable reuse. And so we assumed a split between those potable and non-potable reuses um, per another data set um, in the plans um, that showed historical um, divisions between uh, potable and non-potable reuse. And we assumed that that stayed constant going forward. Um, it was certainly a simplifying assumption that might not hold going forward. It might um, be a different split between potable and non-potable, but um, without further information for each of the 400 suppliers, um, that was, um, we thought that was an appropriate uh, simplification. And um, we did look at specifically for LA in the case study, um, how a more significant shift to recycled water, um, replacing other sources from outside of the region, um, what the implications would be for energy use. Um, and I think that there is a, in, we can go back to one of the earlier slides or it's in the report, how exactly uh, potable water uh, potable and non-potable recycled water compares in terms of its energy usage to the other sources. Yeah, I, th I think on I generally too, just to build on that, um, recycled water generally falls sort of in, in the middle, I would say. It's less energy intensive than seawater desalination, um, more energy intensive than local water sources and groundwater. Uh, and in most instances, it's less energy intensive than imported water, um, in particular imported water to, to Southern California. So, so again, that was one of the things we evaluated in that Los Angeles case where we saw that there was an energy savings opportunity by reducing reliance on water imported from Northern California in the Colorado River and instead pursuing recycled water. I, I will, though, say, too, that there is a difference even within recycled water. As Julia noted, there's there's recycled water that's used for non-potable purposes, 
or for agriculture that's less energy intensive, as you start to get more to potable, it, it becomes more energy intensive. But again, the, the still the, the trend of less energy intensive than desal and in most cases to, to imported water um, holds in, in either case. We do think there might be some interesting opportunities. And again, we just kind of played around with this and, and it's still a little bit uncertain, but some of the regulations around direct potable reuse are under development now. We expect to see more of that in the future. It's unclear yet what the energy implications of that, although the, there are I, potentially some opportunities that direct potable reuse could be less energy intensive than indirect potable reuse because with indirect potable reuse you're typically treating the water multiple times um, so it's still a bit of an open question because we're not yet sure what the treatment requirements will be or how that'll play out but it's certainly an issue an issue to watch and i should add i just look back on the report to confirm the number um, even with the water supplier projections that we were using um, from the 2015 plans uh, across the urban sector, there's like a 300% increase in um, potable recycled water. So even um, five years ago, there was uh, a big increase. Yes, it's still a small share of the total portfolio, but um, we have included uh, a big uptick. Okay, if thank I could, you. Colleen, ahead, if I could please. also add, uh, this is, an opportunity to highlight again that there's a lot more detail in the report about the regional results. Uh, Heather's comment that if you're replacing very energy intensive imported water with recycled water, uh, that has one with less less energy intensive recycled water, then there's an energy and greenhouse gas benefit. Some parts of the state, uh, local water is less important or, le or is less energy intensive. And if you're replacing it with re more intensive energy intensive recycled water, there might be a negative consequence for energy and greenhouse gas emissions. So I, I urge if you're interested in the regional results, take a look at the report. Again, Colleen put in the um, handout section where you can get it uh, and there's more detail there. Great. So we have two questions that I'll kind of ask side by side. Um, one is why is urban water so much more energy and greenhouse gas intensive compared to agricultural water um, and a somewhat related one is what does decarbonization of agricultural water look like does it require heating what is the sort of energy intensity looking like there so if you could perhaps speak to the the differences between each in terms of intensity and opportunity to reduce I can jump in on that and then maybe, uh, Julie, if you have anything to add. Uh, the urban water, uh, that water is 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 tr typically treated, treated to drinking water standard um, and, and prior to use, there, and there's energy for that. Um, there is also energy in using the water in homes and in businesses, often typically heating it, um, although there can be some on-site treatment there too. And then with on the indoor uses, at least in the urban area, there's wastewater that is then collected and treated and discharged, and all of that can, can require energy. Um, compare that and contra contrast that with agriculture, where yes, they may be using more and pumping more water and pumping it potentially from greater depths. Um, they also, though, rely on surface water. That water doesn't isn't typically treated. Um, there isn't and there there can be some on farm usage if they're pressurizing it for drip, but there's not wastewater. So to, to be treated typically. So, you know, and that, that that's the main reason it, it's less energy intensive. Um, it doesn't have the wastewater, the treatment, the wastewater treatment or the end use energy. Yeah, basically that and uh, heating water is surprisingly a very energy intensive uh, and it dwarfs a lot of these other um, energy requirements across the managed water cycle. So um that's one of the big reasons besides the treatment requirement differences great thank you um so next i'm going to jump to a couple of policy related questions policy and regulation questions um, the first is related to sigma um, do we need to return to it to revise it to bring about significant changes and improvements before 2040 as we look out to our future climate goals um, and on sort of a second hand, 
um, in addition to Sigma, will these types of policy recommendations that you've highlighted in this report be part of the CARB 2022 scoping plan update? So sort of what are the policy prospects? Peter, you want to take Sigma? I'll take the, the second part, the CARB. Yeah, sure. I mean, let me say right up front, um, this report in particular was not an analysis of Sigma. Uh, that that's a, a a critically important issue, especially as we've seen with this year, last couple of years with the drought and the loss of surface water and the continued massive overdraft of groundwater. Um, maybe I should speak only for myself, but I, I do think that there there is a need to rethink Sigma and perhaps to accelerate the timelines in which uh, the groundwater basins are re structured and remanaged, the goals are set for bringing those groundwater basins back into balance. The faster we do that, uh, the more likely we are to have a positive impact on both the greenhouse gas emissions and the energy use in the agricultural sector. But that, again, that's a very difficult political conversation to have. Sigma itself was a political, a difficult political thing to achieve. Um, but I do think uh, one of the things we've learned in the last couple of years is that the race to the bottom for our groundwater basins is continuing, uh, that the long timelines for implementing Sigma have not have not prevented that and perhaps in some cases accelerated that. And on the second question about the, the ARB's investment plan, um, I absolutely think there are opportunities um, to include water in, in that or to include it to a greater extent. Um, the, that investment, a draft investment plan was, was just released. Um, we, we certainly provided some comments on that. I do think that's one potential vehicle, but there are others as well. There are um, drought related funds that are being made available that could help uh, with this. Um, there are a number of other sort of state funds that were, have been recently announced um, that, that could be used to help us meet our water, energy, and climate goals. So I think there is a real opportunity to take some of these recommendations and, and implement them. Well, let me say one more thing actually that comes to mind. Um, as Sigma is implemented, I think it's inevitable we're going to see some ag land come out of production and some agricultural water use reductions. Uh, I think it's possible to have a strong, healthy agricultural economy anyway. But if that's true, those changes are likely to dwarf the kinds of changes we saw in our report, which really focused on urban encroachment, uh, changes in ag efficiency in, in terms of pumping. Uh, that could greatly reduce in addition, some of the energy and greenhouse gas emissions associated with it, the ag sector. But I will also point out that, as we noted at the beginning, the emissions and, and energy use in the water sector in California really are dominated by the urban sector. Uh, even though total ag water use is bigger than urban water use, energy and greenhouse gas emissions from the urban sector are larger. And so the results that we've seen in this report from the urban sector changes uh, are still likely to be critically important to pursue. Thank you. Um, I, I think this might be a good question for Heather. Did you examine the CPUC water energy nexus calculator? Could the calculator be updated to assist this effort? Great, great question. So the calculator is actually being updated now um, and, and we are working on that. Uh, in fact, um, there is going to be a public workshop uh, October, I'm sorry, I don't have the date right off the top. Is that October October 8th, I believe? Um, so if, if, if this person's interested, they should certainly look um, on the CPUC's website. Um, I, you can also contact me, I can provide some of that information. Um, I do think it is an opportunity to better uh, incentivize some of the embedded energy savings associated with these water efficiency measures. Um, right now, the, the energy IOUs are not getting credit for that. That is not being integrated into their cost effectiveness analysis. And so, help, uh, you know, updating and revising the calculator is part of that, but there are also some, some, some other way, some other uh, sort of needs for integrating that into the decision-making process there too. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions related to opportunities to generate energy through our aqueduct system. So I want to ask those jointly. What water and energy conservation contribution would come from piping and including energy turbines in pipes for state water project and other open water conveyances? 
And another attendee asked about potentially including solar installations on aqueducts. I haven't explicitly looked at those. I, I will say that there is a lot of uh, renewed conversation, particularly on on the latter, um, and looking at sort of solar. I think it's a it's a topic that's sort of come and gone in years. Um, I, you know, my understanding is there's some there's been some new analysis. I do think there there can there may be challenges associated with it. Again, I haven't I haven't studied that in great depth. I would I'd look to my other panelists if they have any thoughts to share on that. Well, I would add, we, we didn't look at that. Uh, there is some potential for in-stream small hydro generation. Uh, it's probably pretty expensive, relatively speaking, from an energy perspective. Uh, and again, the second part of the question, as Heather addressed, may, maybe the, the best response that is perhaps expand the DWR's ability to produce renewable energy, both as part of powering the state water project. Uh, that would fit into the decarbon, the broader decarbonization strategy of the state. Uh, and, you know, it's an economic question about whether D DWR will pursue that and whether it's better to put panels on top of the aqueducts or put panels on unproductive land elsewhere. Th those are economic, economic questions that I think are still up in the air. Yeah, I also can't really comment uh, in depth on the floto, I think flotovoltaics is what Heather <laughs> referred to. Um, but in terms of the hydropower piece, we did net out the hydropower that's produced as water comes downhill um, from the major conveyance uh, projects. So that is included, um, or sorry, not it's netted out of our energy requirements. So the existing ones, at least. Um, as you've just ended on that note, someone did have a question about assumptions about declining hydro energy supply moving forward. Um, I know that large scale hydro counts for some energy goals and not for our RPS targets officially. Um, so I'm not sure how that uh, fed into the energy mix assumptions that you included in your scenario analysis, but perhaps you could speak to the role of declining hydro power. Yeah, um, we did not explicitly include climate impacts um, on hydropower in the energy mix and therefore the greenhouse gas intensity of our future energy mix. Um, but that is certainly something I'm interested in and I'm working on in other research um, because it will affect our carbon intensity. Um, and it might mean that to meet our greenhouse gas goals, we have to procure more solar, wind, and other renewables to make up for those uh, decreases. I would add, um, uh, again, that did not particularly appear in the climate scenarios that we integrated into the study. Uh, we did at the Pacific Institute a few years ago after the last drought, release a report on the decline in hydropower generation as a result of the drought and the implications both for greenhouse gas emissions and consumer energy prices because we burn more natural gas to replace hydro lost during droughts. Uh, that report came out after the, the previous extreme five-year drought. Uh, we're doing an update now. We won't have the final results till the probably till December when the final energy data are available for California, but we will do that again for the, the recent two-year drought Normally, hydropower is about 15% of our electricity generation. Uh, during the drought at the moment, it's close to seven or eight. So it's a very significant drop during droughts. And whether that will get worse as the climate, climate uh, changes kick in uh, is not perfectly clear from the scenarios, but it's something we're keeping an eye on. Okay. As we uh, near the end of our hour here, I wanted to perhaps end with this question. Um, before I do pose it to our speakers, I will remind all of our attendees that this presentation recording will be sent to you. Someone did ask whether or not uh, slides could be shared. You can feel free to email me, Colleen at next10.org, and I can coordinate with you to get that to you. Um, and for anyone else whose question we weren't able to get to today, I also encourage you to reach out to myself or our panelists. I'm happy to direct questions to them. Um, to see if we can get you any further questions or feedback you might need on this important research. 
So with that, our final question, um, we've covered a lot of ground in terms of policy recommendations and we understand that it's complex and there's a lot more detail we all need to understand on the regional variances in, in terms of these implications and findings. But to try to cut through the noise here, what steps can we realistically take in the next few years, whether that's five or 10, to impact the current projections in terms of water-related energy and greenhouse gas intensity? Um, you know, not at the highest level, but perhaps not just what are the steps that can be taken, but what are our best hopes for actually achieving those from a, you know, perhaps political reality perspective as well? Well, million dollar question. I'll jump in. Um, the policy recommendations that we made are fairly general and they come out of the results of the report. For example, uh, remove natural gas water heaters. Um, whether that's done by providing incentives to homeowners, financial incentives to homeowners by changing building codes locally or at the state level, we are not explicit. Uh, that, that's Those are policy questions that have to be debated by policymakers, by the legislature, by individual water agencies that might have strategies for encouraging that kind of change. Um, so I, I think the things that we want to do are, in, first of all, at the broadest level, reiterate that the water sector is a really important player when it comes to the state's energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. And up till now, we have not integrated those together. We've sort of ignored the water sector. And there are these strategies that we can do uh, at the local level, even at the individual level, if, you're, if your water heater breaks, think about getting an electric water heater rather than a natural gas one, up to discussions with our legislators, with our policymakers, about how to better integrate water into the goals that we have to achieve for reducing emissions. Yeah, I mean, I, I would also just to 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 remind you know everyone we we're, we are in a drought, and and these droughts are I think. Uh, highlight some of the challenges in our systems, but provide some important uh, opportunities. And we often see a renewed interest and focus, particularly from, from the public, from various businesses, from, from within the agricultural sector to make real change. Um, and we've seen in past droughts, some pretty dramatic reductions in water usage that have, have led to significant energy and greenhouse gas savings. Um, we see that these in many cases are permanent savings and so i look at you know the drought that we are currently in and the opportunities around particularly around urban efficiency you know we are going to have to make those changes to address worsening conditions and i think the good news is those can provide dividends for years to come through lower water energy and greenhouse gas emissions so i, I think there is a, a great sort of opportunity and this this work really highlights and, and demonstrates that um, there, there is an opportunity for us to, to you know, solve these issues um, with with tangible things that we know are are possible. Yeah, I would echo the earlier comments, especially what Heather just said, um, that focusing on water efficiency in the urban sector can be a win, win, win uh, in terms of energy savings, greenhouse gas emission savings, and saving water. Um, as our water supplies become more vulnerable under climate change, it will just make us more resilient to those shortages in the future. So um, I think that's the best bang for the buck. Great, thank you. Um, we're a couple minutes past the hour, so I just wanted to, before we wrap up here, uh, let everyone on today's webinar know that it, we are very interested in making sure that our policy community in the state is able to access and understand the findings of this report. Uh, at Next Time, we think this is very important research. As we indicated at the outset here, this is a very challenging and complex intersection that is not as well understood as it could be. So we're so grateful to the team at the Pacific Institute for working on this report and sharing it with us at Next10. Um, and we want to encourage you, those working in the field and on these issues, to reach out to us if this work can be of help to you and your organizations or agencies. We would be happy to connect and to speak further on this. 
Um, so with that, I'd love to just thank again our speakers, Peter, Heather, and Julia, um, give you a moment to say anything you would like to as we close up here and thank our attendees for tuning in today. We're, we're glad you could join us. Great. I just well, wanna, yeah, I just wanna thank Colleen and Next10. It's been a great collaboration. Uh, there's of course a lot more work to be done in all of these areas and uh, we look forward to the next steps. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.